If you're looking for dinosaurs, you've come to the right place. This is the Royal Tyrrell Museum of Paleontology, Canada's largest museum devoted exclusively to the study of ancient life. The museum is based in Drumheller, Alberta, Canada, known as the dinosaur capital of the world. The rugged badlands of Alberta are a hotspot for uncovering Cretaceous Age dinosaur remains, and the museum has been collecting, preparing, and researching these remarkable fossils since 1985. One of the museum's most scientifically significant specimens is the armored dinosaur Borealopelta Mark Michelli. It belongs to a family of dinosaurs called nodosaurs, known for their large shoulder spikes and their bony armor. Now, nodosaurs lack the tail club that their cousins, the ankylosaurs, have. This fossil was discovered by a shovel operator in northern Alberta during oil sands mining operations. The museum often receives reports of marine fossils found in the area, a result of the large inland waterway known as the Western Interior Seaway that covered much of North America during the Cretaceous period. This fossil, however, was unique. It belonged to a dinosaur. It was painstakingly uncovered in the museum's preparation lab by technician Mark Mitchell, who spent about 7,000 hours over a span of five and a half years working on the specimen, which is why the dinosaur was named after him. Around the time of its death, Borealopelta floated out to sea, later sinking to the ocean floor and becoming buried in the mud. Now, this unique environment helped preserve the dinosaur in three dimensions, with all of the armor and skin still in place. And thanks to the pristine condition of the specimen, our paleontologists have been able to learn a lot about this animal. Here's lead researcher, Dr. Caleb Brown. Behind me is Borealopelta Mark Michelli, which is the world's best preserved armored dinosaur. Now this specimen is exceptional for a few reasons. First of all, when you find armored dinosaurs, you often find them scattered, with their bones scattered and their armor scattered. In this case, all the bones are in light position and all the armor is in place. So it really allows us to learn about the armor of the animal. Secondly, within the body cavity, we found this mass that is interpreted as stomach contents. And when those are sectioned and looked at under a microscope, we can see what the animal's last meal was. It was dominated by ferns, and it shows evidence that it was living in a conifer-dominated forest that was subject to wildfire. Finally, we can look at the preserved skin, and we can actually find some examples of the preserved pigments there. And then the animal had a reddish-brown coloration, and then it probably had some form of countershading, darker on top, lighter underneath, which acted as a form of camouflage to hide it from predators. Not only is Borealopelta the best preserved armored dinosaur, it's also one of the oldest dinosaurs known from Alberta, dating back to the early Cretaceous about 110 million years ago. But it's not our oldest record-breaking specimen. For that, we go to the Triassic Giant Gallery. One of the legacies of the former curator of marine reptiles, the late Dr. Betsy Nichols, was the collection and study of the world's largest known marine reptile, Shonosaurus sikeniensis. It's an ichthyosaur, which is an aquatic reptile with a dolphin-like body. Here's Dr. Don Brinkman to tell us more about this unique specimen. I'm Don Brinkman, and this is one of our prized specimens, a giant marine reptile from northeastern BC. It was collected by Betsy Nichols under very challenging conditions. The rock was hard, it was difficult to get to, and it was really, really big. Betsy just persevered and developed a plan to collect it. She raised the uh, financial resources available. She started working with another paleontologist, Makoto Manabe, from Japan, and together they tackled collecting the specimen. Collecting it was a process that took over three years. It came out in multiple blocks. Fortunately, there was a helicopter in the area that offered to lift out uh, the block. It's of scientific interest because it's really the first vertebrate that reaches this enormous size. Betsy explored the idea that this was a filter feeding animal. And there's a number of lines of evidence that uh, point to this. And one is the jaws don't have teeth in them. So this was the first one to sort of exploit this filter feeding mode of life and reach this really enormous size. The skeleton measured an astonishing 21 meters long, making it the largest known marine reptile skeleton. And speaking of marine reptiles, let's go see another supersized predator that prowled Alberta's ancient seas. Rich fossil deposits are often uncovered in southern Alberta in amylite mines. What is amylite? It's a rare gemstone, unique 
to this part of the world. It's the preserved shells of extinct squid-like marine creatures called ammonites. In the inland sea that covered much of Alberta during the Cretaceous, ammonites lived alongside various fishes and mollusks, sea turtles, mosasaurs, and the last of the plesiosaurs, the elasmosaurs. Various specimens have been uncovered here in Alberta. In 2007, a brand new species was discovered, Alberta nectes vanderveldii. The entire animal measured 12 meters long. Most astonishing of all was its neck. That was more than half the length of the entire animal at 6.75 meters. The neck is made up of 76 individual bones called vertebrae, the most of any animal, alive or extinct. For comparison, a modern giraffe only has seven neck vertebrae, just like us. Now, during the preparation of this fossil, technicians also uncovered at least 97 gastroliths, also called stomach stones, that the animal ingested near a beach. Dr. Donald Henderson has studied this specimen very closely and has puzzled over the purpose of these smooth stones. So this is an elasmosaur. It's one of the plesiosaurs. And these animals are characterized by extremely long necks and long flippers. Here's one of the front flippers. You can see it right here. But another thing is that all the plesiosaurs are found with stomach stones. And we've got a really nice sample right here. And you can see all these different sizes of stones. They're so consistent with plesiosaurs that people have wondered why are these animals ingesting them. The old idea was that the stones were to help them sink, but this animal probably weighed about two tons, and there's just a few tens of kilos of stones, if that. It's a tiny fraction of the total body weight. It could not help them to sink. The other idea was that it would be for digestion, because we birds today will eat grit, but birds are eating seeds and tough foods, and they need to grind them up, and birds have a gizzard. But these animals were carnivorous. They would be eating shrimp and little fishes. Meat is much easier to digest than plant. They do not need the stones to grind up food. So I like to do computer modeling and thinking about what were these things like as living animals. And I found that when an animal like this was floating at the sea surface, without the stones, it would constantly bob and never come to rest. But if I put in about 1% body weight of stones, it damped out the oscillations and it settled down it could rest at the surface. So I think these animals were using these stones for some sort of control of their stability, um, not to do with eating or sinking. The skull of this specimen is missing, which is quite common for plesiosaur fossils, but here's an example of what it would have looked like. Their small heads with these needle-like teeth were adapted for eating small fish and shrimp but it also meant the skulls were only weakly attached to the rest of the body, causing them to often detach before being buried and fossilized with the rest of the animal. And before Alberta nectes was buried, we know that it was scavenged by sharks, as evidenced by the isolated shark teeth fossils and the tooth marked bone. There are over two million fossils in the museum's collection the majority of which are housed safely behind the scenes in special collection storage areas. Some fossils require a microscope to see, while others weigh several tons. It's here that we find our next record-breaking specimen, an Ornithomimus, a bird-mimic dinosaur that roamed Alberta 76 million years ago. Its discovery in Dinosaur Provincial Park back in 1995 was completely by accident. It all started when the museum's former palynologist, Dr. Dennis Brayman, was collecting a bed of well-preserved leaf fossils from the park. The team removed over three meters worth of rock from above the fossil, but when they were mere millimeters from that leaf bed, they struck dinosaur bone. The museum's former curator of dinosaurs, Dr. Philip Curry, was called in to safely collect the specimen. Now, since the fossil was protected within the rock and wasn't exposed on the surface, the skeleton they uncovered was almost completely intact and articulated, with the bones in the same arrangement as when the animal was alive. This excellent preservation also meant that some soft tissue was preserved as well. Dr. Francois Terrien explains. I'm sitting in front of the best preserved skeleton of an ostrich mimic dinosaur, so well preserved that it even preserves the traces of feathers that formed the wing in this animal. If you look closely at the bones, you'll see black marks running all along the bones of the forearm. 
that looks like someone went with a marker or a sharpie and started drawing on the bones but that's not the case those black marks actually fossilized traces of the roots of feathers that formed the wing of the animal by comparisons with other specimens of feathered ornithomimids, we discovered that the wings were absent in young individuals, but only developed later in life in these animals. So because the wing developed only in association with puberty, we think that the very first wings evolved not for flying, but rather for courtship and display, such as to try to impress a mate, scare away a potential competitor, and so on. And it's only later through evolution that wings were used for flight. The second line of evidence for soft tissue we have at the tip of the snout, you can see an orange rind covering the upper and lower jaws of the animal. That orange rind is the fossilized remains of the keratinous sheath that covered the tip of the snout of the animal. In effect, it's just like a bird beak. So for all of these reasons, this specimen is the best preserved ornithomimids ever discovered. The pose that this dinosaur is in is called the epistatonic posture, or death pose. The museum has several exquisite skeletons preserved in the same way, including our last record-breaking specimen. Tyrannosaurs are a very popular group of dinosaurs. And here in Alberta, we have an excellent fossil record of these animals. One of the most recognizable specimens is this 76 million year old sub-adult Gorgosaurus labratus skeleton from Dinosaur Provincial Park, currently displayed here in the Royal Tyrrell Museum's Foundations Gallery. Now, although movies sometimes portray paleontologists uncovering perfectly preserved dinosaur skeletons in the field, this level of preservation is incredibly rare. There are many processes that affect the fossilization of animal remains after death. Several factors can negatively impact an animal's body once it has died including the actions of wind, water, and scavengers. For a fossil to be preserved as an articulated skeleton like this one, where all the bones are in the same place when the animal is alive, required fast burial after death. This specimen is one of the most complete, if not the most complete skeleton of a young Tyrannosaur ever discovered anywhere in the world. At five and a half meters long at about 11 years of age, this animal is only 60% of its full adult size. If you look at its lower leg, you can see that this animal had a leg injury. The fibula is broken, and that probably occurred during a fall. But what's really interesting is you can see the bone is swollen. So that tells us that this animal not only survived the fall, but also lived long enough to fully recover from its injury. And then this animal also gives us a glimpse at what the feeding behavior and the lifestyle of young Tyrannosaurs was like. They were more lightly built, they had longer legs for running, they had very narrow blade-like teeth, and they had a weak bite. But around the age of 11 years old, these animals underwent a transformation. They started becoming way more solidly built, more robust, their teeth became more swollen, and their bite force started increasing dramatically, even exponentially. And it's thanks to those transformations that these young tyrannosaurs could start hunting large plant-eating dinosaurs like duckbill dinosaurs and horned dinosaurs. So for these reasons, that specimen behind me is truly exceptional. We hope that someday you'll have a chance to visit the Royal Tyrrell Museum of Paleontology in person and see some of these amazing specimens for yourself.